Conserving, preserving, and passing on. All topics we'll cover on this edition of P. Allen Smith Gardens next. Smith. In today's show, we're going to cover a range of topics such as keeping the past alive by preserving native lands, passing on recipes, and protecting the environment starting in our own backyards. First, we're going to Chicago to visit the Chicago Botanic Garden where we'll learn a little bit more about the beauty of the native prairie and the ways they're working to preserve it. Then at Callaway Gardens, we'll see how to transplant daffodils from your spring displays into the landscape to naturalize for future bloom. Next, I'm going to show you some really big bugs and tell you about why we should be conservative with our use of chemicals in the garden. And finally, I'll pass on a recipe for some great tasting biscuits that I picked up while visiting Natchez, Mississippi. You see, today's show is all about preserving, conserving, and passing along, and we'll dive into those topics right after this quick break. If you had visited this part of Illinois about a hundred years ago, this is probably what you would have found, a magnificent prairie. But sadly, some of these plants are endangered. According to reports, 12.5% of the world's flora faces extinction. Surprisingly, the U.S. has the fourth most threatened plant population in the world. This prairie is actually part of the Chicago Botanic Garden. Here they're trying to maintain its pristine quality for the future so they can learn more about the plants that could be called the original citizens to this country. Carrie Havens and Galen Gates with the Botanical Garden tell us more. The grass family has been very important uh, from an economic standpoint, certainly sustaining literally civilizations. It's also a natural resource that is dwindling at a very rapid rate, I'm afraid. Um, here in the state of Illinois, there is less than one-tenth of one percent of native grasslands left really? today. That's true. Well, this botanic garden sat at one time in the midst of the prairie. Yes, it did. Uh, this was a very rich area, a tall grass, a tall grass prairie and great diversity, and uh, most of it is gone today. Kay, thank you for bringing me into the busy lab today. What are some of the specific things you're doing here in the lab to, to help thwart extinction? We have projects um, that range the gamut from monitoring rare plants in the field to doing genetic work like we're doing in here today. We have a seed banking program and we think of the, the seed bank as kind of a safety net in case something happens to the rare plant in the wild. We have seed that can reintroduce that species. So often when we think of endangered species, we, we tend to think of the rainforest, but actually there are a number of species that are endangered right here in this country. Yeah, most people don't realize that 29% of our flora is considered rare. And when you think about what's happened in the United States, there's been a lot of habitat loss. Um, things like the prairie have been converted to farm fields. Well, how much of the prairie has been lost? We used to have 22 million acres of prairie in Illinois. Now we have about 2,000. My heavens, that's staggering. It is, and so you can see why species that live in the prairie are now becoming quite rare. Why would the average gardener or citizen of this country be concerned about what may seem like an obscure grass growing in the prairie and it being endangered? Uh, I sometimes think of an ecosystem like a game of pickup sticks, and you can lose one species or two species and nothing happens, but at some point when you lose three or four or five or six species, the whole community collapses and no longer functions. And if people want more information about plant conservation and what botanic gardens are doing to protect rare plants, they can check out the Chicago Botanic Garden website, which I believe is linked to yours. Yes, absolutely. From preserving native lands to expanding your landscape, we'll take a look at reusing daffodil bulbs next.
Daffodils. Well, I have to be honest, they're probably my springtime passion when it comes to flowers in the garden. One of the nicest aspects of this plant is that they'll naturalize in the landscape, unlike many tulip varieties. In fact, in a garden I've been designing, we created a large field of daffodils. Every spring, they emerge in a wave of bloom. I also use daffodils and other bulbs in containers. And when the spring is passed, I can transplant these daffodils into the landscape, just as they do at Callaway Gardens in Pine Mountain, Georgia. Hank Bruno tells us more. Here at the gardens at Callaway, spring usually means azaleas, but more and more it's also coming to be daffodil season. That's because daffodils naturalize wonderfully here in the south. There are many varieties that do very well year in and year out. Ice follies is one that we particularly like, but there are many to choose from in a wide variety of colors, sizes, and shapes. There are just a few simple rules that have to be followed to get daffodils to come back year after year. Essentially, pick a good naturalizing bulb, get it from a reliable company that will sell good landscape-sized bulbs. It doesn't pay to start out with something that's already anemic. So get a good, solid bulb, and then plant them well. A little soil preparation with some organic matter will help. The key is to have excellent drainage. Daffodils do not like to be in wet soils. So if it's a heavy clay, you need to do some organic matter amending in order to make those bulbs thrive. Spring bulbs are planted in the fall, so start to make your plans early while you see the colors that you want. For example, if you want to echo the forsythia behind me with the yellow cup in your daffodil or go to a straight yellow daffodil, that's also possible. The important thing is mark down the varieties that you want now so that when the bulbs become available next fall, you'll be ready to plant in November. At planting time, you put a, a good organic amendment in the soil, but not any fertilizer in the hole. Plant the bulbs deep because they are going to be there forever, so you only get one chance at that soil amendment. Get that done quickly and then put your bulbs at 8 to 12 inches deep, not because of frost so much as to keep those bulbs down in those cooler soils. And we want those bulbs to go dormant um, in their off season and not be disrupted by anything that may be going on above ground, that is a lawn or a ground cover bed that we're working in. Uh, we want those bulbs protected by a good layer of soil. The daffodils that we plant here are used in naturalized drifts. You don't put them in rows and line them up like soldiers, but make nice gentle sweeps and curves so that it looks like um, nature intended. That is, that they kind of came up on their own and, and have started to travel around in the landscape. It's also a good idea to plant some other bulbs with them. For example, up above we'll have some later blooming uh, hyacinthoides. Those will come on and, and give us a, a later spring display along with our daffodils. Here at Callaway, we get multiple uses from our bulbs. We'll buy some in and use them in an annual display for one year and then take them up and immediately transfer them into the larger landscape where they naturalize and come back year after year. And that makes sense. If you've got a small plant budget, you can get a lot of use out of one set of daffodil bulbs. Is something bugging the plants in your garden? Up next, organic solutions for fighting common garden pests. So stay with us. If you spend any time outdoors during the summer, you know that dealing with insects is just a fact of life. Thank goodness there aren't ants this big running around the planet. Now, as a gardener, it's important to understand the difference between good bugs and bad bugs, particularly if we're interested in a healthy environment. That's why I take a certain approach when I deal with pests in my garden. I take an integrated pest management approach, which simply means I first take measures that have the lowest impact on the environment, and then, if necessary, I take a more extreme approach later. For instance, if you notice pests on your summer vegetables, you certainly don't want to spray a chemical on them that might make the produce harmful to eat. That's why I go for hot pepper spray that contains a paraffin wax and capsaicin. That's the chemical naturally found in peppers that makes them hot. While you certainly don't want to get this on your face or in your eyes, the wax does wash off, making the plants and vegetables safe to eat. I've found hot pepper spray to be an effective and organic way of dealing with certain pests like leaf hoppers, spider mites, and white flies. Like I've said before, you want to be careful about what you spray on your plants because you need to encourage beneficial insects, like these ladybugs. It may be hard to believe, but there can be an army of over 1,500 ladybugs in one package. 
These gals have developed quite a reputation over the years as having a healthy appetite for aphids. But ladybugs just don't stop here. They also enjoy eating scale and mealybugs, as well as mites. During a visit to Earthbound Farms in Carmel, California, farm manager Mark Marino showed me how they attract beneficial insects like ladybugs to help protect their acres of organic produce. Well, we usually like to put about 5% of our land on these ranches with this beneficial insect mix, and we do it on the edges because it takes a different kind of care. It also is here a lot longer than some of our crops. We have lacewing larvae, ladybugs, trichogamma wasp, praying mantis. Another type of beneficial insect, which is not a predator, but it does a lot of pollinating of our crops, is the uh, honeybees. Some of the plants that we have in here are the bachelor buttons in the blue and the pink, baby's breath here. We have some different legumes and California poppies. On a home garden, it's really a nice thing to do because it gives an area for the population of the beneficial insects to increase. Plus, it's so beautiful, too, that it's actually like having a little flower garden next to your vegetable garden. I get a lot of viewer email these days, and I have one in particular I want to share with you because I think it will help many of you as you begin to design containers that will last from spring until fall. This is from Linda in Maryland, and she writes, I see a lot of plants at the nursery that I like, but I always end up bringing home flowering plants. Then I see the containers you make, and I notice that you use lots of plants that don't bloom. This year, I want to do something more dramatic any suggestions for non-flowering or foliage plants to try? Well, I think the word dramatic is the key word here. Foliage can bring so much drama to your containers. Just take a look at all of the colors you can find in a single leaf. These coleus are excellent for hot sunny locations. Now for shade, just take a look at this gorgeous ivy. I love the deep variegation in it. This wonderful cream juxtaposed this dark green. This is a great plant to add life and sparkle to dark, shady areas of your garden. Now, I follow a couple of rules of thumb when I create containers using foliage. Often, I'll allow the foliage to be the guide or springboard for the entire color scheme of a container. For instance, I'll take the colors in a coleus leaf and bring blooming flowers into the container that echo or match the colors I find in the coleus leaf. Now, Linda, some other dramatic foliage plants you may want to consider include Persian Shield with its almost metallic-like leaves, the spiky cordyline, cannas, black elephant ears, and these exuberant sweet potato vines. Now, another point to keep in mind in arranging your containers is to go for plants that have different plant shapes or forms. For instance, I always try to use something tall and spiky in the center of an arrangement then I fill in with something that's round and full, and then I finish it off with a plant that cascades or spills over the edge of the container. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to visit Beds and Borders, which is owned by Kathy Pufall. Kathy, since I was here just a couple of months ago, when we put these containers together, they have matured so much. They've grown beautifully, haven't they? Just look at this, that trailing rose coleus, how it works with the caliber co, it's just magnificent. Picks up the pink beautifully and right on up it to the mandarin. It does right up the, to this tall spiky element. Absolutely, it's very yeah. dramatic, and this plant just does so well in such a variety of conditions. I love it. Well, it's such a great way to get height by taking a, a, a trellis or just some, some sticks and pulling them together and growing a vine on it. Look at this, my gosh, this formium is so bright. It's incredible, I love formium. And this is formium yellow wave, and the contrast of the yellow with the blue container, and we bring the yellow down into the Lysmachia. Oh yeah, it's just a knockout. It really is. I really like fullness in a pot. I believe it. <laughs> there was a title You're of very an, generous. <laughs> there was a title of an article once that I loved that said she just can't contain herself. And <laughs> I think that kind of spelled it out. Pouring abundance into these containers. Now each week I answer viewer mail on my website, pallensmith.com. So sign up for my newsletter. It's a great place to be introduced to new plant varieties like these. 
You know, recently I stumbled upon a recipe for biscuits. It's one of my favorites. And you know, in the fall, there's nothing like the smell or aroma of fresh biscuits in the kitchen. And boy, do they taste good with strawberry preserves. Some friends from Natchez shared this family recipe with me. And what makes it unique is the fact that it's been modified to suit restricted diets by eliminating salt and sugar. You see, to put it together, all you need is flour, shortening, baking powder, artificial sweetener, and skim milk. Just cut the shortening into the dry ingredients until it's mealy. Next, add the milk, baking powder, artificial sweetener, and knead it together. Roll the dough out on a floured board until it's about an inch thick, and then cut the dough with a biscuit cutter and place the biscuits on a baking sheet. Bake at 350 degrees until golden brown. What's great about this recipe is that you can make an extra batch and keep it in the freezer for using later. Pass it along to friends who have to watch their intake of salt and sugar. I think you'll find these biscuits are especially tasty. In this garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile Oh, no, I can't help but smile 